Hello Trampians, welcome back to day two of the WWE Marathon. This is Raw number two, January 18th, 1993. Now the episode starts with Rob Bartlett ripping up a picture of Bobby Heenan saying, Fight the Real Enemy. I watched the demographics and all the analytics and everything on my channel, so I know a lot of you that are watching this are going to be younger and might not get the reference. This is a Something that happened in October of 92 on Saturday Night Live, Sinead O'Connor. You might know her, she did uh, a live walkout song for Conor McGregor a couple fights back. Uh, but she was an Irish musician, she's an Irish musician, she was very popular at the time. She, uh, she's done a few covers that got big. She was on Saturday Night Live, she did a cover of Bob Marley's War, and during the live episode, contrary to what she did during rehearsals, where she had held up a picture of a refugee child and you know it was supposed to be this whole thing that was you know take care of the children during the live performance she held up a picture of Pope John Paul II tore it up while saying fight the real enemy this was before the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal got so big that you couldn't ignore it so a lot of people were ignorant of it so people hated her for it it was such a firestorm. She got so much negative press, and it's the kind of thing that WWE these days would not even touch. If you doubt me, think about how many times Donald Trump has been mentioned on Raw since he started his campaign. That is so toxic that even though the McMahons are donors to his campaign, or rather to a super PAC that supported his campaign, they will not mention him on TV he is so toxic but here 14 years ago they're jumping on this grenade just loving the idea that they could get something out of it so times have changed very weird this is before the attitude era even I mean it was a stupid reference to it but it was a reference nonetheless and then immediately after that happened Randy Savage was attacked by Repo Man who immediately ran off and then when the first match started Savage wasn't on commentary, so it was only Vince and Rob Bartlett making Repo Man the greatest heel in the history of WWE. Thankfully, a, a few minutes into the match, it was a terrific Terry Taylor versus Mr. Perfect. A few minutes into that match, Randy Savage does come back, and he does provide commentary. Not a great uh, commentator, but definitely better than Rob Bartlett. And Vince McMahon definitely needs somebody competent there to pounce off of so very very necessary now terrific Terry Taylor you guys might know him as the Red Rooster because he's this big story of a stupid gimmick he was always kind of a vacuum devoid of charisma but not of talent he was always solid in the ring not great but good so this is a good match. It, it could have been a lot better with the right build, with everything working for it. Uh, they, they do a, a phone interview with Bobby Heenan during the match, which is weird because Bobby Heenan hadn't been involved with Terry Taylor for a while, but they never acknowledged that he was the one that made him the Red Rooster. But he's there to hype the Ric Flair, Mr. Perfect feud that's going on. We'll get into that. Uh, but the match lasts basically long enough for the phone interview. And then when the phone interview's over, it ends. So Ric Flair comes out to attack Mr. Perfect. Rob Bartlett goes for the second Buttafuoco joke in two weeks, calling Ric Flair Amy Joe Buttafuoco. So it's it's weird. Uh, yeah. He's a morning radio DJ, and you're not going to forget it. So, Mr. Perfect gets attacked by Ric Flair. They brawl outside the ring with the ref's back turned. Terry Taylor tries to take advantage. It backfires. Mr. Perfect pins him in a roll-up match over. He goes to find Ric Flair. Then we have Bret Hart come out to the ring for a promo uh, to hype his match at Royal Rumble against Razor Ramon. Bret Hart, we remember as being so great in the ring. There's a reason we don't remember as being so great on the microphone. He wasn't a great promo. But he tried. It, it was okay. And then we get Marty Jannetty versus Glenn Ruth. 
And this is weird because Glenn Ruth actually did wrestle a couple matches on SmackDown last year. Glenn Ruth is Thrasher of the Headbangers. This is before they took on that gimmick, obviously. I'm not even sure that Chaz or Mosh was part of WWE at the time. But here, Glenn was a very fluorescently dressed uh, enhancement talent. And it's weird to be the less flamboyant fluorescently dressed wrestler in a ring, but he pulled it off because he was wrestling Marty Jannetty. Uh, this match went on a little bit longer than you would expect with it being a jobber match because they had another phone interview this time with Shawn Michaels hyping his match at Rumble against Marty Jannetty. But as soon as that phone call was over, Marty Jannetty took control of the match and it ended very quickly afterwards. Funny how that works. Uh, they do a quick recap of an angle from Superstars, which was a follow-up from the end of the first episode of Raw. We talked about how Doink the Clown and Crush got into it while on Superstars that next weekend. Doink revealed that he had been using a prosthetic arm and used it to beat Crush with. Fun. Doink, stupid gimmick, worked so well. Uh, Sean Mooney catches up with Repo Man, speaking of stupid gimmicks that worked so well, uh, where he's bragging about stealing uh, the Macho Man's hat. Ridiculous looking hat, I don't know why that's what he would steal, but they end up uh, fighting over video interview and basically teasing a street fight which we don't see come to fruition. Then we have a Mean Gene Royal Rumble hype segment. These were more uh, these were a lot more prevalent at the time. They kind of fell out of uh, use a little bit later on where backstage announcer would just run things down without any input from the wrestlers themselves. It was It was weird, but it worked at the time. We don't see it anymore. Uh, the last match is Tito Santana versus Ric Flair, and it was a good match. Tito Santana was a good wrestler, not a great wrestler, a good wrestler, and Ric Flair was Ric Flair. Uh, a lot of times you hear people talk about Ric Flair in his prime, and they're talking about late 70s or early 80s, but I would say it even goes up to this point in the 90s. Uh, he... He really was still that good, and that's why he's Ric Flair. He had such a long period of success. And there's such a little overlap between Ric Flair being at that level of quality and Raw being a thing. We'll get to that. Spoiler alert. There's a reason for it. But it's very cool to see Ric Flair on Raw at this level of his career, when he came back later on, he was not Ric Flair. He was the ghost of Ric Flair. So th this was actually a pretty good match. Check it out. Um, it ends in a schmoz because they're doing something. He ends up by going outside the ring with Tito Santana, and there's the count out, but it seems like it was because they mistimed the run-in with Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect comes out, attacks him. They have a pull apart, and then the show ends with them basically challenging each other to a loser leaves WWE match, which we'll get to not tomorrow, because tomorrow we are going to be looking at the Royal Rumble. We will be looking at Raw Episode 3 the day after tomorrow. And that is when we will get to see Mr. Perfect versus Ric Flair, loser leaves WWE. Please check it out. Come back tomorrow for the Royal Rumble. That's going to be a fun one. Hit like, hit subscribe, I love you. We're going to be throwing up some videos here and here. Please check them out. As always, I am the Tramp. Cheers.